Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the multi jurisdictional law panel. Uh, my name is Kazi, and I'm an events officer of the Queen Mary Bar Society. Uh, I will be co hosting this event with Kavya, who is also an events officer of the Queen Mary Bar Society, and she will be asking the questions to our panelists today. So uh, let's introduce our panelists. Our panelists practice in multiple jurisdictions, and our first panelist for today is Mr. Trevor Burr. 25 Bedford Row. Uh, sorry, my bad. Uh, my, our first panelist for today is Mr. Trevor Burkusi uh, and Miss Rachel Barnes. We are waiting for her. Uh, they're from Three Raymond Buildings, and and we have Courtney Griffiths QC from 25 Bedford Row, and she will be joining us in a bit. Uh, we also have Fiona Robertson from Two Hair Court, and finally we have Carlos Carvalho from Three Verulam Buildings. So may I ask the panelists if they're all right with the event being recorded? Certainly. Perfect. Uh, so just for housekeeping, uh, may I ask all our guests to mute their microphones and like if you have any questions or queries, you can type it in the chat box and we will get back to you in the end in our Q&A session. And so before Kavya starts asking the questions, uh, may I ask the panelists to briefly introduce themselves? Now we can start with Trevor Burke, you see, sir. Certainly, um, probably because I'm the oldest. Uh, okay, uh, practice in three Raven buildings, crime, defense crime. I've not prosecuted since I took silk, which was 20 years ago. I prosecuted a bit as a junior, but I always was primarily a defense advocate. Um, since taking silk, I've appeared in the Cayman Islands, Trinidad, British Virgin Islands, Turks and Caicos, Nigeria, Dublin, Belfast, European Court of Human Rights, and I surprisingly once gave expert evidence in a federal court in New York, um, always defending. Um, there's various questions that will come along shortly about, you know, a typical week in, when you practice overseas or common misconceptions or how I ever got there, all of which I'll deal with later. Um, so for the time being, I think that's a sufficient introduction to me. Uh, we can move on to Fiona Robertson. Hi, everyone. Um, I am a barrister practicing at Two Hair Court in London. Um, I worked briefly in Ghana for a few months prior to starting my pupillage uh, and was working to a human rights firm there. I then got tenancy at Hair Court, um, and in 2012, I went and worked out in the Cayman Islands for what was meant to be a 12 month stint and ended up being three and a half years. Um, I came back in 2015 and I've practiced back at Hair Court ever since then. I predominantly defend in crime. Um, I would say my practice is 90% criminal defense, but I do the odd bit of public and private prosecuting and a little bit of regulatory law as well. Kazi, you're on mute. Sorry, uh, Mr. Carlos Carvalho, please. Uh, hi there. Uh, I practice in international arbitration uh, and I have to make a disclosure here like I'm not a barrister. I'm actually a qualified solicitor here in England and Wales. Uh, I'm a Brazilian lawyer, first of all. I worked as an advocate lawyer in the courts of Brazil for a little bit more than 10 years before I moved to the UK. Uh, at Riverland Buildings I coordinate uh, our International Advisory and Dispute Resolution Unit, in which I try to team up our associate members and members of chambers to do international pro bono work. I also teach international arbitration at the LLM at Queen Mary uh, in, uh, as a teaching fellow. I have a consultancy firm here in Brazilian law and arbitration called Tribe Arbitration. And I'm also an editorial assistant uh, to the World Arbitration Reporter, 
as an arbitrate and an arbitrator in Brazil, and a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Uh, in Brazil, as an advocate lawyer, I did everything you could think of: uh, employment law, family law, tax. Uh, but but uh, majority of it was commercial uh, cases. I did one criminal case. That's why a little feel I feel a little bit of an intruder here. Uh, with so many uh, great criminal barristers, but uh, yeah, that's it in international arbitration most. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we can next move on to Rachel Barnes. Hello there. Well, thank, firstly, thank you ever so much for inviting me. Um, I'm only up the road in Hackney, so I love coming to events, even if it's virtually at Queen Mary. So thank you for that. But uh, like Trevor, I'm at Three Raymond Buildings, which is where I practice from, which, as he indicated, it's a criminal set, but it has a very strong international um, public law bent. And that's exactly what I do. So I do a number of um, uh, criminal practice areas, corruption, fraud, a lot of sanctions work, uh, corporate crime, any of those cases that has an international element to them. And likewise, um, public law cases that have a crime or criminal justice element to them uh, and also cases which have a international uh, public international law element so I'm on the attorney general's panel of counsel for public international law and I also do civil cases that likewise have a criminal justice or PIL public international law element to them so an example would be acting for the uh, Iraqi claimants in claims against the MOD for abuses that happened uh, during the Second Gulf War. The public law side of things, by way of example, I'm currently involved in judicial review proceedings in a Caribbean jurisdiction uh, that relate to criminal proceedings here in the UK. And I do quite a lot of extradition law. Um, my international background is that I am uh, started off as a US practitioner and my confession this evening is that I'm actually the least qualified person at the UK at the English bar. So Carlos's uh, confession was that he's not at the bar but he's a solicitor. Mine is that I'm the least qualified person because I never went to bar school in the UK. I cross qualified as a US lawyer which meant I did a three-day course. So that is a loophole that's now been closed, but I got in there just in time. So that is my story to the bar. Um, so US lawyer, UK lawyer as an English barrister, practice also in the Caribbean. I've practiced in cases in front of the International Criminal Tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and in front of the UN Security Council Ombudsperson in relation to certain sanctions cases that we may come on to. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so our, our co-host Kavya will start asking the questions now. Uh, Kavya, the stage is yours. Thank you for that. Some very inter interesting backgrounds. Um, I think we're ready to dive into our questions. Um, so naturally, practicing in multiple jurisdictions sounds like a very daunting and exciting career experience. So uh, what has motivated you to pursue a career in multiple jurisdictions and what about it appeals to you so much? Well, at the bar, of course, what people don't understand or appreciate, unlike working for a, a city firm, if you stumble on an international practice at the bar, it tends to be more accident than design. It's if the phone rings and your clerks are approached to instruct you in a case overseas, um, it's pretty much beyond your immediate control. I was very lucky in that a very successful pupil of mine had gone to Cayman on a temporary, he was only supposed to be there for about six months, but actually stayed and established a career and just at the time I took Silk in 2001, um, he had an enormous case that broke in Cayman and fortunately briefed me. It was the first time I'd been overseas then. And that 
trapped me in Cayman for 13 months. It's a fantastic case, really good case. Um, it was a bit like practicing at the Old Bailey because everybody in it was English. The prosecution team were English and all the co-defending teams were English silks. So there were a lot of familiar faces in the trial, but that was my first um, overseas venture. And then it appears in your profile and it, it, it sort of established a bit of a life of itself, really. People thought, oh, Trevor will do a case overseas. Um, and then I had various opportunities, all of which I seized. I, I love to travel and, you know, I love to do work overseas. It makes for a variation of a, a normally staid English practice. Um, and then I found as I got a bit more of a grown up at the bar that people started to brief me in either arbitration or civil cases that had a criminal tone to them. Um, because I don't know if it's a popular misconception or a true conception, but the civil bar believes that if you're an experienced defense silk, then cross-examination is your daily workload. And if there's a fraudster on the other side in a civil case, some solicitors believe that if you parachute a criminal silk in to cross-examine or make a speech or, or deal with the criminal side of it, it benefits the case. I'm, I'm not sure it does necessarily, but um, that certainly brought me work in Nigeria where it was thought I could contribute to the team effort by <clears throat> cross-examining people who were making allegations of criminal conduct against various clients. Um, and once a reputation starts to build, it, it's amazing how it takes off, really. And a lot of people speak about, uh, you know, they'd love to practice overseas, but at the criminal bar, there's not that many who are able to pull it off because, I mean, I've been briefed at least three times in Hong Kong, but was never admitted. Um, they have a fairly strict rule in Hong Kong that unless it's truly exceptional, they won't admit an English silk because they have so many capable silks who practice routinely in Hong Kong. So some jurisdictions are very difficult to get into. Others, particularly the Caribbean, tend to welcome um, silks from the UK as just by the very nature of a small jurisdiction, they don't have many homegrown silks because there simply isn't the volume of work that would sustain a silk in full-time practice. So if a very serious crime is committed, it's very often the case that they recruit a silk from England to prosecute and defend. Uh, in fact, most of the work I do in Cayman will have a friend, somebody I know well, who is briefed to prosecute. It's also not unfamiliar to see a judge brought in from London to try the case. So you'll have a London judge, a London prosecutor, me defending, and the local bar will act as our juniors, obviously. Um, and so it, 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 it's difficult to explain. It's the motivation was simple. It was being offered a brief, you know, and the idea that you could be in the Caribbean in November when it's wet and cold in London doing a murder in, in Cayman or Trinidad or the BVI or Turks. Um, who, who would say no, frankly? I mean, it's a fabulous opportunity to travel. Um, and as I say, once once you've got one or two under your belt, it, it, it's amazing how others just simply seem to come along, you know. Um, and it's been the it's been really great to to travel to these far distant lands. Although, as will become clear from some of the questions, the advocacy actually remains the same. I mean, people think it's somehow different, but actually, it's not. Your job is exactly the same as it would be in London subject to some local variations, but essentially your job is the same, just the view out of the window is slightly different. Um, 
I suppose if you work in a firm of solicitors with an, an established international practice, you'll be exposed to it much quicker. But at the bar, it's, it's luck, I'm afraid. And that plays a big part in life at the bar. And I was lucky. Um, all of us would do it. I was lucky enough to be given the opportunity to do it. Thank you, uh, Fiona. Would you like? We, we'll just go in the same order as uh, the introductions. So. Sure. Um, for me, I had always enjoyed traveling um, and experiencing new cultures. Um, I got a scholarship from Inner Temple um, that allowed me to travel to Ghana and intern at a human rights organization for several months between doing what was then the BBC and starting pupillage. Um, and I really enjoyed the experience, but I had no real concept of whether or not actually practicing in multiple jurisdictions was even possible, particularly at the criminal bar, particularly at the junior end. Um, and what happened for me, uh, again, like Trevor says, it's kind of luck um, of being in the right place at the right time and not necessarily having the ties that might stop you. So for me, a couple of silks in my chain had approached the head of a uh, law firm out there and kind of offered a swap of um, sending a junior tenant out as a secondee um, and on these sort of cash chambers. Um, and I was a very baby tenant at the time. I was not long into my tenancy um, and I was offered the opportunity. Um, and for me, I jumped at it. Um, I was given, I think, 24 hours to decide. Uh, my head clerk took me out of that in the evening and got me very, very drunk. And I remember being on the phone to my dad drunkenly saying, do you think I should do this? I don't know if I should or not, it's scary. Um, and I just felt, you know what, if I don't do it, I'm always going to wonder. I was 25 at the time. I didn't have any real ties to London, you know, I didn't didn't own property, I uh, didn't have kids or anything. And I just thought, this is the time to do it. And if I never, if I don't give it a try, I'm always going to wonder. Um, and so that was ultimately why I ended up going out. Um, and the other benefit for me, particularly at that stage was, I was actually working out there full time. So as I say, I was meant to do 12 to 18 months, I ended up doing three and a half years. And it was a really good experience for me to be able to cut my teeth um, in another jurisdiction and make my mistakes in front of judges that I might never have to see again. Um, and also just sort of learn, I was able to be exposed to cases that were way beyond my call level of what I would have been getting in the UK. So in the UK, we've been doing ABHs, burglaries at that stage. Um, my first trial out in Cayman was obsession of a firearm, which you just wouldn't have got here. And it meant that when I then did move back, I was actually in terms of experience almost a couple of years ahead of my contemporaries because I've been able to build up this very serious criminal practice very quickly. Um, and again, a lot of that is because of the respect that other jurisdictions have for the English bar and the quality of the training that we get uh, over, over here and how that can translate um, over to other jurisdictions. Well, <clears throat> in my case, uh, it was also not uh, planned. Uh, it just happened, uh, just like yeah, yeah, Trevor mentioned as well. But uh, but not from a practice manager. In this case, it was my wife. Uh, I met uh, my wife in Brazil. She was Welsh, and at some point, she wanted to come back here. And uh, when I arrived here. I was, I realized that working in uh, multiple jurisdictions was the only way to go. Uh, but that was another thing that helped me make this decision because of, of course I could have said no. But uh, in, when I was working in Brazil, I've been in nearly 400 hearings as the leading counsel. I've done terror oral, oral arguments uh, before the court of appeal there. And my mentors there, they would say to me, like, uh, from here up, it's not just more about learning more about the law. It's about who you know in the courts, 
uh, and how your personal relationships can uh, navigate you through appeals and uh, the Supreme Courts and things like that, as it happens in some jurisdictions and Brazil is one of them. And uh, I don't know, I wasn't very excited about that. And the perspective of coming here and starting a nail and, uh, and to build something uh, completely from scratch uh, using my experience uh, sounded like a good thing to do. And, uh, and, uh, and, and the bar welcomed me to do that. And I and now managed to, to work in many different jurisdictions. I've, I've been doing projects in Africa, I've been uh, working with the World Bank, with the IMF, giving consultation to least developed countries. And I never imagined I would be doing that. It was, but uh, it's very appealing for sure. It's, uh, it's, it's much, very different from what I used to do. And I used to do, uh, what I really used to love going to court in Brazil. It's, it's really interesting to, to work in multiple jurisdictions. But, well, for me, I think, as I said, I um, started off life as a US practitioner. So I did an LLM in the States and then I had um, uh, people coming up to campus doing uh, uh, interviews. And so I thought, oh, well, it sounds like a good idea to do an interview uh, here. I had a place back at, at bar school in the, the UK, but instead I took did these interviews got offered a job in new york thought well i'll take it for a year see what happens um and so on and so forth so actually i think probably very similar to what fiona trevor and carlos have said none of this is really planned really carefully it's just a, a, a lucky opportunities pre, uh, present themselves and one thing leads to another so when I ultimately decided to come back to the UK, something I, I was very keen to do um, when I come into the bar was to try and maintain practice in other jurisdictions or what's probably more accurate for me, and I think Carlos has touched on this, is being involved in cases that are in multiple jurisdictions. You may not be acting as a lawyer appearing in a court in those other jurisdictions, um, um, but you're involved in cases with um, teams of lawyers, or in my case, certainly I'm involved in a number of cases with teams of lawyers in various different jurisdictions. Um, and actually practicing in other jurisdictions, the US or the Caribbean is a very small part of what I do. Um, but what appeals to me about it, I'm probably the same as everybody else has said, it's really interesting to work with other lawyers who have come from, uh, and in different countries, who come from things with different experiences, different uh, strengths. And personally, I find I, I really appreciate that. I learn from it. It's a little bit like being a magpie, you know, something shiny over there in somebody else's nest. You take a little bit of that and try and put it into yours to see if it can make you a better practitioner. And uh, certainly that's been my experience. I've really benefited from seeing how other people do things with different, slightly different cultural backgrounds. Uh, and having that is something, as I say, that really appeals to me. That's brilliant. Thank you for that insight. Um, coming to my next question, I think Trevor touched on this a little bit earlier. Uh, what, according to you, are some of the most common misconceptions about practicing in multiple jurisdictions? And uh, would you like to bust? I think the most popular is it, it, it's somehow different from conducting a trial in London. In fact, it, wherever you are, um, your job is primarily the same, but I, I, I've always found it whenever I've traveled to foreign jurisdictions that there's a bit of a weight of expectation that you don't have in London, that the local bar think you're this sort of whiz kid who breezes in on the BA flight and brings some, something additional to the case that warrants your physical presence there in the first place. I, I'm always very conscious of the fact that, you know, people think, well, we've brought this guy in at, you know, considerable expense and inconvenience or whatever it is, and they expect 
miracles, especially the clients who think it's all over once you pop along to the prison and meet them that, you know, you're somehow going to save the day. So, so I always find, um, I'm always impressed at how very much the same it is wherever you are. Even in Nigeria, which is the oddest environment, it is odd in every sense of the word. From the moment you get off the plane till you get back on it, it's just a totally weird environment. But once the door of the court closed and you actually got on with it, it was just the same as doing a case anywhere else. No jury in Nigeria, of course. Um, it was an arbitral panel extremely gifted retired Supreme Court judges and senior judges and experts in the field of international arbitration. Um, another thing that's always impressed me is the quality of judges. In all my years of practice in, in front of great, great judges in London, I mean really gifted judges, and I don't know if Fiona agrees, my, my standout favourite and most impressive judge has always been Anthony Smelly, who was the Chief Justice of the Cayman Islands and still is. And I've done lots of work in front of Anthony Smelly, who was, a, I think, a Chancery practitioner in his native Jamaica, came to Cayman as an in-house prosecutor with the DPP, went on the bench, rose pretty quickly to be Chief Justice. And this man is hugely impressive, both intellectually and his compassion for defendants, his ability to engage with the jury. I mean, I, I'm hugely, hugely impressed with, I really was impressed with him. And, um, and you'd be, you know, in a small jurisdiction, I was quite taken aback at how really good he was. Um, and, you know, this is from somebody who's appeared in front of all the great judges in London from time to time, but practicing in England, I'm pretty sure he'd arisen through the ranks all the way up as well, because he was pretty impressive. Um, so apart from the long trip to get there, the often an uncomfortable environment of hotels, in hotels in Nigeria, even the good ones are pretty basic, um, but the work is as hard, if not harder. Uh, the thing that always impresses me is how unfailingly polite the local bar is. You would think there'd be a measure of jealousy or resentment that you're there depriving some local senior practitioner of a brief in a case, but that's never been my experience. The, the welcome is always, I mean, I can't remember a case where I haven't had dinner with the judge at least once, uh, or they invite me to their homes, I meet their families or the prosecutor. Uh, I remember when I did a trial in Trinidad, I was taken out on a boat fishing and there's always golf on a Saturday. I'm a huge golfer and the minute people hear you play golf, there's always lots of golf invites and, and, and the formality of the English bar, which it, it can be pretty formal, even for those who practice here all the time, once you're a visitor from overseas, everybody goes out of their way to make you welcome, to make sure you're comfortable and extremely on a social basis than you'd ever get in London. And even the judge is inquisitive. I mean, you know, what's life like in London? What's the gossip at the bar in London? What's happening? So you, you enjoy a slightly elevated status which as soon as you get back to London of course fast disappeared you're just treated as an irritating defense counsel in most cases whereas overseas they're grateful that you you're there um, they're quite 
it's quite flattering. Several times I've had third year law students from the local university. They're told, oh, we've got a visiting silk from London and they'll pitch up and sit in the public gallery in the hope of learning something and come and speak to you afterwards. And so it, it's, it, it can be a touch of an ego boost until the verdict, of course, when it all goes horribly wrong and it was a complete waste of time that you travel there in the first place. But apart from that, it's always enjoyable, but surprisingly, it's always the same. That's my experience. I don't know if it coincides with everybody else's. Fiona in particular, I mean, she was an old hand in Cayman by the time she left, but it was not dissimilar to London, was it, Fiona? No, in fact, I would say probably the biggest misconception is how unglamorous it is in many ways, because as soon as you say to someone, oh, I worked in the Cayman Islands for three, three and a bit years, they think that you spent your weekends with international money launderers and on yachts drinking champagne. Um, and that's just not the case. I mean, there are, don't get me wrong, there are boat parties, there is champagne, but you are ultimately there to work. Um, and actually, the reality is it's often not terribly glamorous. Um, the notion of living on a Caribbean island is very attractive. And, and Evan always says, why would you come back? But life on a Caribbean island is still real life. And it has got its own challenges. Um, in Cayman in particular, it's a very small island. Uh, you can drive across it in an hour. Um, and that can be really challenging, particularly if you're a defence practitioner, because if you're there full time, as I was, um, well, I, I read about Trevor, people are always very impressed when you come from England, and there is, um, in Cayman particularly, you only prosecute or you only defend, um, and if you only defend, it is met with a measure of suspicion by the local police force. Um, and certainly I was aware, um, whilst I was in Cayman, I was representing some very high profile gangsters on the island and things like I know my phone was tapped, uh, it was going on. Um, and so you have to be prepared for if you're, if you're going to be somewhere long term or you're going to be representing someone very high profile, that there are potentially things that might go on that you wouldn't necessarily expect. And that can be low level as well, you know, on a tiny island, you have to be prepared for the fact that you will bump into a client or police officers or prosecutors when you're out in a bar. Um, and it can be that lack of privacy can be quite difficult. Um, and you're also working hard. Um, it is a different way of working from in the UK, predominantly because you don't tend to have the long commutes. Um, but you're still working hard, there's still expectations. Um, and I think also there is the challenge of uprooting your life. So if you're moving somewhere permanently or, or on a semi-permanent basis, or if like, for instance, Trevor, you're doing a 13 month trial, you do have to be prepared for the fact that you've got to totally uproot your life for the period that you're going to be in another jurisdiction. Um, and that means you will lose contact potentially with solicitors in London. You'll have to reestablish yourself when you come back. But also when you're over there, it's it's not easy. And I'm, certainly the first six months I found very, very difficult. As exciting as everything was, I was on the other side of the world from my family. I saw them maybe twice a year if I was doing, if I was lucky. Um, and that can be challenging as well, particularly, you know, the, the days you're having a bad day and you want to speak to your mum and actually there's an eight hour time difference and you can't call her because it's four in the morning where she is. Um, so it's great, it's a fantastic experience. It's something I would recommend everyone tries to do, but it's not going to be this sort of glamour that you think it might be, I would say. Yeah, I think uh, I, I have to agree with Fiona on this uh, common misconception of uh, how glam glamorous is it, it is, uh, and it isn't for sure. Uh, I have colleagues at 3VB in the context of arbitration in multiple jurisdictions that ended up inspecting sites with water and mud up to their waist in the middle of the jungle or in very dangerous situations. 
also engaging with uh, local council and uh, local government in many different countries uh, can be very different from the experience we have here in the UK. And of course, in, in this talk here, my experience is a little bit different because I made the I I I went the other way around. I went I came from a, another jurisdiction uh, to the UK, and I remember when I came here. Uh, well, one thing that you 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 think that you're gonna go to a different jurisdiction, and they're gonna be really wanting to have you there, or that your experience is invaluable, and not necessarily it is because of course. Uh, uh, different cultures will see this in different ways. And uh, I came here with a lot of experience and I had to uh, start from basically zero. Um, I was doing very high profile work in Brazil when I came here. Uh, at, after a couple of years without doing any work here uh, and uh, after I took my LLM, I, I was so desperate to do something that I started applying for paralegal positions, I saw myself in a room full of kids applying for training contracts in law firms, doing document reveal. And I was only there because it was a case related to Portugal and they needed someone fluent in Portuguese. It wasn't for my legal skills. Uh, but of course, if you have your experience back home, that will help you speed up things and climb the ladder much faster. And that's what I did here. But I would agree with that, uh, that Fiona said about the not being glamorous uh, or necessarily glamorous. I imagine for some people it is, uh, especially if you do this move when you're a little bit uh, uh, more senior. And uh, I also agree, I think Rachel already mentioned one misconception that you would be there in front of the case when uh, generally you are part of a team with different lawyers from different places and some of them would be better placed than you to do some parts of the of the work in a different project in a different case. So for me answering the same question, I'm going to touch on some of the things that other people have said, but I've got four points or four misconceptions. Uh, firstly, as has been said, it's not all glamour. Uh, Trevor might be out on his golf course on a Saturday, um, but not all of us, sadly. Um, and, you know, when you're in client conferences, one conference room looks very much like the other. And if you're doing document review, you're preparing for a trial. It doesn't matter really whether you're in a room in the UK or a room in the Caymans. Or in my case, I remember it really clearly when I was doing a case where I'm practicing in New York. Uh, and it was the first big overseas case I was doing. A really interesting corruption thing. Just started as a uh, associate in a big um, US law firm. And it was a corruption case that involved an American bank buying a um, Brazilian bank. And uh, there's a big hole in the finances, so which uh, lots of money had gone to a Caribbean jurisdiction. So myself and the part, two partners on the case go down to Brazil and I work my socks off. I don't think I saw Brazil apart from 10 minutes. I remember when I was uh, in Rio and I was able to stand outside in a suit in the sweltering hot heat looking at the beach. And that was my um, first glamorous international case. There was no glamour to it whatsoever, apart from a lot of sweaty jealousy on my part, looking at the people on the beach. So um, it's not all glamour. Uh, it, I think for me, um, and it may be different for others, but actually it's not truly multi-jurisdictional. At any one time, you tend to be focused on practice in one particular jurisdiction. So whether it's Trevor's, 13 month case, whether it's Fiona mentioned uh, the time she spent in the Caymans. Uh, most of the cases, if you're actually practicing elsewhere, you're just focused on that one place. It's not jet setting around the world. Or as Carlos has mentioned, being part of a global a team of lawyers from different jurisdictions where they're actually doing the practicing in a, one particular jurisdiction but you are part of a team helping say a client manage their exposure or a claim in a variety of different countries so um it's not 
it may be multi-jurisdictional, but your part is one small part of that whole. Um, three, uh, and Carlos touched on this, actually, um, yeah. you may not be the best person in respect of that overseas jurisdiction. People who practice their day in, day out, the local lawyers may know more than you do. And, um, and that can be a great benefit. I found I've learned a lot from that, but um, very often other people, certainly as a junior, my uh, position as a junior may know more about the jurisdiction um, probably do than you do. I mean, I've, most of the time I've been welcomed. Uh, I think the only time I really remember not being welcomed was a judge in Florida calling me a Yankee lawyer for coming from New York. Now, I think I'm the last thing, last person to be called a Yankee lawyer. But anyway, uh, I think that told you what he thought down in um, the badlands of Florida of these New York lawyers coming down to run a case or be involved in the case. Uh, and the fourth point, quite the opposite from that, actually, is um, uh, been touched on before. It's a hospitality that's extended to you and not just by other lawyers, but by people generally. I've really benefited from, from that. Uh, Trevor's mentioned his golf. I run a lot and I've uh, been able, I never thought that being a multi-jurisdictional lawyer would help me run around the world, but I have had great pleasure. I've trained with the uh, Beirut Marathon team. I've, um, you know, run in parts of Beirut that I never thought I would ever do past uh, the bombed out parts of um, Beirut. I've run quite quickly in those parts um, to being in East Africa to running with uh, people there who they, you know, they're not, some were lawyers, some were not, but the hospitality that's been extended has been just fantastic. And that's something I, well, you certainly don't go in for, into it for that, but that's been a wonderful thing. Thank you for that. Some great stories there. Um, the, the next question is actually about a typical week, but I'm gonna add on a bit to it and ask, um, just based on what Fiona uh, spoke uh, mentioned earlier, uh, how do you actually manage to balance working in different parts of the world? Because it is essentially uprooting yourself and uh, you know, or trying to orient yourself to different surroundings. So how does that work out? I think the key is you have to have a very supportive family. I'm blessed my wife was a member of the bar, so she understands the, you know, the life of a barrister and the pressures and what have you. Um, but going back slightly trespassing on the previous question, I didn't want to go into it too much, but um, I remember, apart from the glamour of appearing overseas, I remember each time I went to Nigeria and I've been well, there a number of times now, it's, it's always a bit daunting and it's always happened to me is that you're met by an armed guard off the plane, put into a secure car with a man with a machine gun sitting next to you and in the passenger seat, because robbery is such a common uh, occurrence in Nigeria that the clients who invariably were oil companies, all their executives are, and their visiting lawyers are all guarded 24 seven for fear that something terrible would happen. And many years ago, I used to smoke cigarettes and even stepping outside the hotel, because oddly Nigeria had a no smoking policy in hotels, <laughs> which is just slightly weird, but and obviously, um, you, you comply with the local law. So I would leave my room and go out into the car park for a cigarette occasionally, and there'd be a scurry of armed guards following me as if I was the president of the United States. I always found that really disconcerting because although I never expected a problem, if somebody is going to the trouble and expense of having an armed guard around you, you think, could I be in some way at risk here? So I never shared that with my wife at home when I Zoomed her every day or phoned her every day that, you know, if you hear the click of something, that's the guy sitting just across the room cocking his gun for some reason. But I think the most horrifying, just to give 
the downside of international practice is when I did a murder in Trinidad being led, I was very junior at the time, it was the first and only capital case I ever did where the client was hanged. Um, but I remember he was a he was a, a sort of gangland figure who had allegedly, or so the jury determined, had murdered various family members of a rival gang. And I remember the true horror of what crime really is, is that two days before the client was executed in the prison, the severed head of his wife was delivered to the governor in one of those beer coolers. You know, we're all familiar with them. You take them to the beach full of ice and beers. And the rival gang had captured his young wife and chopped her head off, literally chopped her head off and delivered it to the prison with a warning that as the client went up the scaffold, he would have known that the rival gang had got to his entire family. And I remember thinking at the time how brutal crime truly is. Wherever you practice it in the world, that was just a grotesque example of, of what was a perfectly pleasant client. He, he gave instructions and, you know, he, he was a personable enough individual, but you, you cannot take your eye off the ball if you practice serious crime, that occasionally you're going to be in a room with a very, very dangerous individual. And that really was a wake-up call. I was about 12 years call at the time, being led by a English silk. We'd all traveled to Trinidad to do the case and how brutal, brutal life can be and how cheap it is in some foreign jurisdictions. Cayman, unfortunately, is, is much easier. You, an average day there is you get up early, have a swim, stroll into court. There's no capital punishment there. Pretty long sentences, as Fiona will confirm, uh, marginally longer than like you know the sentences you get for murder here um so not quite the same pressure as there is in some jurisdiction or the or the, the physical threat although thank goodness nothing has ever happened to me but once or twice in nigeria i thought you know this could get very very nasty it's quite an intimidating place so as 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 rachel has said you tend to spend your time either in the safety of a hotel room where you're working or in the safe environment of the courthouse, eating in the hotel because it's just not safe to venture out too much. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's not in any way glamorous in, in the sense that you might perceive it to be. Um, and that is the absolute truth of it, you know. For me, um, obviously, because I was living there full time, um, I was fully immersed into um, Caymanian life, the Caymanian lifestyle. Um, and came into a very, very safe jurisdiction. Um, there's also an element of, provided you stay on the right side of people, it being even safer uh, as a criminal defence lawyer. So I remember, for instance, one night, one of my client's houses had been raided yet again it was about the third time in three days um and I was um nearby actually in a bar it was Friday night and I said look hang on I'm coming down um and I had gone down there and when I then had to go because of where the house was it was actually in quite a dangerous part of Georgetown which is the capital um when it came time for me to leave I had to go and get my car and I was escorted out by essentially the local gangsters um I've sat, I've spent a weekend um, talking to potential witnesses in a crack den in another part of Cayman who were surprisingly welcoming. Um, but for me, uh, a typical week, it would slightly depend on what I was doing. So Cayman has a fused profession, which meant I was the solicitor and the barrister um, while I was working out there. So if I was in trial, I would go into the office around eight every day 
um, work for a couple of hours, then court would start at 10, just like over here, but you only have a five minute walk to court. And then being in court all day doing, doing a trial. Um, if I wasn't in a trial, it would be things like police station interviews, uh, prison visits, um, the, the prison um, was quite accommodating so you try and see all your clients in one day if possible and go along with a big stack of files. Um, so police station interviews, prison visits, conferences with clients who were on bail um, and then all the, the running around that solicitors have to do. So trying to track down witnesses which involves the weekend in the crack den. Um, things like um, billing, you know, really, really uninteresting, unexciting things like billing. Um, and also just trying to stay on top of the administrative side of things, because it's one of the things that I mean, we, we don't have a terribly good listing system in the UK either, but certainly in Cayman, the listing system was quite literally a lady in a room with a gigantic book and would flip through the pages to see when the court could next accommodate a trial. So you'd be trotting off to see Miss Suzanne every other day to try and get something listed for your convenience. Um, so again, not, not hugely glamorous, um, quite similar to what I do here, save that obviously the solicitor side of things you wouldn't do here. And, and that was definitely something to learn that was quite hard at first to see that, particularly in Cayman, I tend to have a lot of repeat clients and understanding the dynamic of the relationship with them and often their family as well, that yes, you were their lawyer, but you weren't always going to be at their 100% beck and call because they weren't their, your only client. Um, and knowing how to keep them at the right amount of arm space, but while still close enough to trust you, that definitely took some learning. Well, I think one thing I was mentioning to Trevor when we were at the waiting room is that the only thing I never thought I would do as an international lawyer would be to homeschool my daughter every day. I'm as I'm, I've been doing here right now, and I. I have to say I'm a terrible primary school teacher. Uh, I, but I think in general, I do, at least for me, it's not too different. It's basically deadlines and meetings every day. Uh, I think the only difference might be, uh, of course, it, it is always cultural. Uh, so for example, clients in, in certain countries, they will WhatsApp me or WhatsApp like a group of uh, barristers that I'm working with and say like, oh, we would like a meeting tomorrow. And we, we, we have to understand that that's how they do things there. And we try to accommodate and be flexible and organize a meeting for tomorrow, uh, which would never happen with the client here. Uh, they would never do that. Uh, and besides that, when you uh, work in, in a team of lawyers in the US, in the UK, in Asia at the same time, is to coordinate all those players at the same team, uh, deal with sensitivities, a lot of ego, cultural differences, and all of that in different time zones. Uh, I think that's that that's what I see different uh, from what I used to do as she's just being like a regional uh, domestic lawyer. Um, well, going long. I'm going to share a bit from what Carla has said. Um, in the yeah, your typical work involve uh, week involves the mundane, uh, all the things you would do uh, in a domestic case. Uh, plus, if you've got as Carla says, if you've got an international aspect, then trying to coordinate and work with people in multiple jurisdictions. And when I was thinking about this, I just reflected upon my last week. So last week, Monday. I had a conference call with uh, lawyers in Rome uh, about a case that's got the Italian and English aspects to it. Uh, Tuesday, I had a hearing in Westminster Magistrates Court um, in relation. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear this, but Carlos is homeschooling, and I also have a screaming child just outside. So I'm going to open the door, then try and carry on. Carry on the so, um, so a typical week may also involve uh, trying to deal with small children. Um, okay. Oops, sorry about this. Um, uh, 
Um, sorry, I'm just going to have to stop for one moment. And perhaps it'll come back to me when I manage to deal with, um, with this little one. Okay. Life at the bar. That's a very good example, isn't it? Absolutely, life at the bar. <laughs> yeah. Well, and uh, sorry, just can I go back one minute and just mention another thing that I, I thought of uh, regarding uh, this, this like a typical day in life that I don't, I don't know about the others because you, you operate in uh, with common law jurisdictions, but I, I think the, the ethical standards in Brazil, for example, are so different uh, that I sometimes have to adjust uh, my, 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 my level when I'm speaking to different people during the day because I've been working here for so long and I'm trying to, and I'm focused on trying to fit in and I trained here. And I, of course, I try to do things as people do here. But sometimes I get told off in calls with Brazilian parties uh, saying like, why, why you do that? Why, why you, you, you show them the evidence that we have? Like, yeah, because that's the right thing. Uh, but uh, in Brazil, it wouldn't. Uh, you're totally allowed to, to hide evidence. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, sometimes it's a little bit difficult just to adjust uh, your mindset regarding those ethical standards in different jurisdictions. That's, a, that's another thing that I, I find it challenging sometimes uh, during my day. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, I think, I guess we'll, uh, let's move on to the next question and then when Rachel can join us, um, that'll be great. Uh, so Queen Mary has um, a large number of international students uh, and a lot of them may be interested in practicing law in the UK as well as their home countries. So what, uh, what are some of your top tips to them or any advice on things that they can do at this stage uh, to be proactive or to increase their chances of succeeding uh, in the future? Because I know a few of you mentioned that a lot of it is down to luck, but uh, apart from luck, what else, what can be done I think without doubt the easiest route, if you're visiting your home country, is to write to a judge, and in, at no cost to him or the state, is to volunteer to be his marshal for two weeks. So you, and I don't know any judge anywhere in the world who is not flattered by a recently qualified lawyer saying, I've just graduated, I've just qualified, I'm considering a practice in my home jurisdiction, I've been studying in London, and I would very much like to marshal with you for two weeks. Uh, obviously, it doesn't cost the judge anything. And what that involves is, and they'll always say yes, always, is that you meet the judge privately, he'll give you a briefing on the cases he's trying in that week or two weeks, you sit beside him on the bench, you get a judicial view of the case, which is often very different from the advocate's view of a case. Most judges whom, when I marshaled, the judge will have a cup of coffee with you at the end of the day and say, well, what did you, what did you think of the day's events? And you'd say, well, I thought, you know, the defence advocate was very effective. I thought he touched on this and that and you know and the judge will say well actually from my I don't think you know and you get a judge's perspective and the the advocates appearing in the case will see that you've got this status as a marshal once you've got that you can write to a, a firm and say your firm or uh, acting for the plaintiffs uh, more than happy to come in to do a mini pupillage or some work experience in your firm, again, at no cost to them. And who's not going to invite a, a promising young lawyer recently qualified to come into their firm, assist for a couple of weeks? This is how you, I mean, it is a lot of luck, of course, but you can certainly shorten the odds by volunteering yourself 
um, just to engage with the local profession, the bar or solicitors, volunteer your services. Um, and that's certainly the route I would recommend. Whenever, whenever I see mini, I, I take a lot of mini pupils who just write to me and say, you know, can we come with you for a week? And I go, sure. And I will go out of my way to introduce them to solicitor friends of mine to say, got this very bright candidate, she, he or she, take him into your firm for two weeks. So when you make formal applications, it's a recognizable name. You know, you've, you've been in the firm for two weeks. People can put a face to the application. They'll remember you. You know, you go round, you volunteer to help, work hard, uh, do whatever works assigned to you promptly and efficiently. And that's how you shorten the odds for yourself. Um, sounds a bit mercenary, but that's the way to do it. And I can't think of a, a single judge of my acquaintance who would not accept a marshal who volunteered themselves. And I'm sure it's the same in all jurisdictions. And that certainly, if my son wanted to go to the bar, for example, either here or anywhere else, I'd say, well, this is a route map, which I would recommend, you know, a bit of marshalling, a bit of voluntary work in a firm, uh, a mini pupillage in an established barrister's chambers. This is all how you progress your career. Um, and that's certainly the way I would recommend uh, all you guys would go forward in your future prospects. Yeah, I agree entirely with Trevor. It, it's this, if it's in London or, or in the UK, it's pretty well the same as for, for instance, wanting to practice in a home jurisdiction, that you need to be looking at marshalling, um, vacation schemes if they're offered, mini pupillages if they're offered, um, and get your name known. Um, the other thing that is definitely worth doing is uh, the Inns of Court are a fantastic source for scholarships, particularly. Um, there are some scholarships that are specifically for wanting to do work abroad, which was the scholarship that I got from Inner Temple. And as a result of that, that then gave me the impetus to go and work in Ghana. And I'm not sure that necessarily otherwise I would have done gone off and done that. But because A, they were funding it and B, it had to be to work abroad, I was quite limited in really what I could then do with that time. Um, and that then gave me at least a taste of doing it, whether or not actually this was something that interested me or not. Um, and you never quite know what might come down the road from things. So first of all, it gets you that experience of working in another jurisdiction. And it gives you that experience of um, sometimes the, what I found with Ghana, the, the frustrations of working in another jurisdiction, how differently things work, or sometimes how slowly things can work, um, the different political pressures that there can come to bear. Um, and it gives you that kind of foot in the door that actually, actually there is something on your CV that you have done um, in another jurisdiction. Um, and so, yeah, that would be my advice. And definitely you've got then the added bonus when it comes to pupillage applications and so on of having been awarded a scholarship as well. Well, uh, as they, are, they uh, I think you already received very good, straightforward advice. Uh, maybe I could tell that in terms of preparation, uh, I think, the key to practice in different jurisdictions is going to be more related to soft skills and cultural awareness. Uh, so I'll try to get, uh, you know, like th those things uh, in hand and uh, and be prepared for uh, to to work. And if you have a focus on a specific jurisdiction, you should not just learn about. Uh, the legal culture, but uh, actually about everything in that culture. I think, I think you have to fall in love for that jurisdiction in a, a bit and uh, and be a little bit obsessed about it. So you can uh, know what to talk about. I think that will help you with the other skills that we mentioned before. At least that's what I've been trying to do here. Uh, but I have to say it's quite difficult to understand the English sometimes. Uh, I think I prefer the Welsh that my wife asked me to say that. But uh, <laughs> uh, but that's it. Yes, I would I would focus a lot on soft skills, cultural awareness. I think that's very important 
if you want to operate in different jurisdictions. Well, I'm back without my three-year-old. So hopefully well, that's going to continue. Um, I would say, firstly, don't have your children anywhere near you. I would say, secondly, I agree with everything that everybody has already said. Um, and thirdly, I would say, maintain your contact book. We used to call it the Rolodex. Um, it's now your uh, contacts book. And that starts with uh, your fellow peers, your students uh, onwards, because your uh, the people you study with are going to go on to be lawyers in other jurisdictions as well, not just in the UK. Uh, and they will grow up as you grow up. And um, we all do. And I have friends who I studied with who are now partners in firms around the world. And we have a WhatsApp group that uh, is slightly, you know, the uh, it's it, sorry, I should say it's wonderful. It's slightly the humble boast as well, where everyone says, so oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. But then again, I last week needed some um advice and input from latin american lawyers and i was able simply to post something on the whatsapp group and a number of people have responded to it so i autom i have a ready bank of contacts from my student days which helped me now in practice and uh, i i it's taken me a long time to realize the importance of maintaining those contacts but i would advise that you do it from now and continue doing it Thank you. Some very valuable advice. Um, now, we've we've spoken a bit about how it's not always so glamorous uh, to work in different jurisdictions. Um, but I was wondering if there was any case, any particular case that's out ordinary that you'd like to share with us. And maybe just to change things up a bit, we can start go the other way around. We'll start with Rachel and then we'll work out. Right. Um, one case that has stood out for me. Um, actually, I, I, I'm going to take the example of a number of cases that I do in front of the UN Security Council Ombudsperson, and that is a quasi-judicial administrative body that acts as a um, judicial function looking at people who have been subject to UN Security Council sanctions because they're alleged to be members of Al Qaeda or ISIS. And what that involves is a lot of petition work, but also everyone goes to whichever jurisdiction that individual is in and has a process that's sort of like um, an interview, sort of like a hearing, sort of like a probation service interview as well uh, with the ombudsperson, the lawyer um, and the individual lawyers and the individuals concerned. And what stands out for me about that process is something that Trevor touched on earlier about the security issues in other jurisdictions. Last time I went to a North African country related to this, we were subject to some fairly obvious uh, 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 you know, dirty underwear drawers following us around, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And what that made me, why it stands out for me is not the pretty low level uh, oppressiveness that we were subject to, but the fact that local lawyers go through this day in, day out. And it's okay for us flying in and knowing that the UN were going to be looking out for us, organizing our cards, etc. But the local lawyers in that jurisdiction have to put up with that day in, day out. And so and much, much worse. And that happens all around the world. And that's what why that case stands out for me is um, realizing quite how lucky we are as legal practitioners. Um, whether it be in the UK or going to other jurisdictions, that by and large, we don't have to face these sort of issues that unfortunately our colleagues who practice on a full-time basis in other countries do. Well, in, in my case, I'm not sure if it's because I started working in different jurisdictions just like a few years ago, 
uh, or if it's because I don't see the effect of what I'm doing in this big case, I don't see the effect like in real life of people. But I still like the, the cases that I remember that uh, I can still feel like uh, that I'm there are the very small cases, some of them right in the beginning of my career. So I, I don't know, uh, I'm not trying to escape from the, the question, but for you guys who are starting your careers, I think you should really value the small cases you to deal with right in the beginning. Uh, they won't be able to to older, so uh, you won't be able to take them again, maybe as a pro bono thing, but uh, great stories about my small cases at the beginning and uh, further on my career, but I don't think not nothing yet extraordinary related to international cases. Um. It's hard because a lot of the case studies that came were really interesting for different reasons. But one um, that probably will always stick out for me was I represented a young Caymanian guy who um, had been convicted, had pleaded guilty, in fact, to manslaughter when he was 14. Um, he'd got into a fight. Uh, he'd fallen in with the wrong crowd. He was in a fight with some much older boys. And during the course of the fight, he picked up a knife and stabbed someone in the back once. And it had hit the... Um, uh, the renal artery and the, the guy had died. Um, the Crown had taken a plea to manslaughter, I think probably a bit on the basis that he was so young. Uh, he was by far the youngest person to face something so serious and came and I think they didn't quite know what to do with him. Um, I'm not sure if I was prosecuting, I would have taken the plea. Um, but I came into the case, uh, whew, by that point it must have been about 10 to 15 uh, 10 to 12 years later. Uh, Cayman, if you are a youth and you're convicted of manslaughter, you can only be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure, which means that you are going to receive an indefinite sentence, potentially, until you're deemed no longer a risk to be released. The problem was the, that uh, the Caymanian prison service, certainly at the time, had no form of rehabilitation, and this guy had grown up in prison. Um, so he wasn't particularly necessarily deemed to be particularly safe because he couldn't prove rehabilitation. Um, and so he had ended up serving a far longer sentence than an adult convicted of the same offence would have, because an adult would have got a determinate sentence, probably of about nine years, um, and came and you served two thirds, so would have been out in six. And by the time I came along, this guy had already um, served, I think it must have been close to eight to 10 years. Um, and it really struck a chord with me because he was my age um, and he was incredibly pleasant to deal with. And I just always thought, God, you know, the right or wrong decision in your life and the tables could have been turned here. Um, and I became involved basically because what happens in Cayman is if you're a new lawyer on the island, anyone who's dissatisfied with their lawyer comes to you for a second opinion. So you get a lot of new clients very quickly, often very quite, quite difficult clients. But this guy was actually very, very easy to deal with. And he just kept saying, no one's listening to me. No one's listening to me. This can't be right. Um, and certainly my gut feeling was something wasn't right about this and I it, it was a case that kept me awake at night which means very few cases do but that means it was really bothering me um, and I was banging my head against a brick wall in terms of my research to try and find a way to help this guy um, and we actually ended up initially challenging the the law in terms of his detention um, on the basis of English human rights um, and so kind of drawing comparisons to cases like the Bulger killers that when someone is imprisoned as a child you have to give them the option to be rehabilitated um, but also give them the opportunity to be released and there was no review of his sentence so we managed to get a review of his sentence which ultimately did lead to him being released. Um, we then later on, whilst I was in Cayman, they brought in the Human Rights Bill um, and we were able to use that to actually challenge the law in terms of the detention of young people at Her Majesty's pleasure. So that was just a really exciting case to be involved with because no one had used that law yet. It was still very new. 
he's probably the only person that these arguments would have applied to. And it was such a um, narrow, nuanced bit of bit of law and factual case. Um, and it was just so lovely to actually be able to finally get this guy out of prison um, and sort of have him say, you're the only person that actually listened to me. And on this occasion, without wanting to knock anyone else, I think I probably had been because slightly everyone had given up on him. Um, so that's one that certainly for me is always going to stick with me. Conscious of the fact that I'm so much older than all other participants in this, <clears throat> I have been truly, truly blessed with a, a, a career that has, when I look back and if I ever write a book about it, it's, it's, a, it's been a truly amazing career, but several cases do stick out in my memory. I remember, oh, five, six years ago, I got a phone call in London that one of the founders of Microsoft <clears throat> had sailed his 22 bedroomed yacht to Cayman. And uh, in the process of trying to park it, if that's the right word for super yachts, he crushed five square miles of Cayman's precious uh, marine life. And the yacht was promptly impounded. Um, and they launched proceedings against the entire crew. And bearing in mind, this was the world's second biggest yacht. The crew were 42 people. So I got a call saying, could you please on Sunday morning be at Biggin Hill where a private jet will pick you up, fly you to Cayman. And can you resolve this problem for the owner of Microsoft because he's, 100 million pound yacht has been impounded by the Cayman authorities. And can you, with the minimum of fuss or publicity, can you broker his way out of this? So off I went. They very courteously put me up on the yacht, which was luxury beyond belief. He had two helicopters on it, as I remember. We managed to get the yacht released and off it sailed, I moved into a hotel. And over the course of the easiest four weeks of my life, I think, we had the occasional meeting. We flew in an expert diving team to repair the coral as best we could and brokered a charitable donation um, to uh, maintain the marine life in Cayman. And we all went off happy. That was quite a fun case. But probably the standout case for me, um, which was the first case I did in Silk, none of you will remember, but there was a very famous rock band in the 90s called R.E.M. Very famous then. They were, I don't know if the youngsters of today even know who they are, but they were pretty big at the time. And the entire band were flying from Seattle to London to appear at the Nel Nelson Mandela concert in Trafalgar Square. Big deal at the time. And the composer of the band, a very talented musician called Peter Buck, took a sleeping tablet on the plane and committed a pretty sensational air rage incident on the BA flight and was detained when he arrived at Heathrow. And I got the call to go to Uxbridge Magistrates Court to secure his bail. So I pitched up, um, he had not been released to the jurisdiction in the sense that he'd not passed through customs, but such was the power of um, celebrity. And I've, I've noticed this, I've done a lot of celebrity cases over the years, such is the power of celebrity that the magistrate admitted him to bail with a 200,000 pound cash deposit. And this was at midday on a Saturday. And because they were staying, um, they were doing a British tour at the time and they were staying at one of the really expensive hotels in the West End, the manager, 
of REM phoned the manager of the hotel and said, we need 200,000 cash prompt. So they raided the safe of the casino downstairs and Peter Buck was admitted to bail by about four o'clock that afternoon. And we had to prepare for his trial. And about four days later, the solicitor in London got a phone call from Bono, who was the lead singer of U2. I think they're still pretty famous. Most people have heard of U2. And Bono wanted to meet the advocate because him and The Edge wanted to give character evidence for Peter Buck. So we were able to run a insane automatism defense. Check that out in the textbooks, how difficult that is. Frankly, we could have run an alibi defense because the jury was so in awe of this band that we had a trial in Isleworth for two weeks. And I remember vividly that Bono, we sat late because his private jet from Dublin had been delayed. And so we had to sit late and the judge was very accommodating and the jury knew we were calling various celebrities to give evidence of character in his defense. And so when we sat at about half 11, he fumbled in in his trademark dark glasses and his hat. And his true name is, if my memory serves, is Paul Hewson. So I called him as Paul Hewson. But of course, the minute he walked in, you two were at the very height of their fame. At the time, they'd just done the Africa Famine Relief single. They, you know, it was the biggest rock band in the world. And I remember when I called him, I said, is your name Paul Hewson? He said, yes. I said, is, are you otherwise known as Bono? He said, yes. And I said, and are you the lead singer of the second largest rock band in the world? And he said, who's the first? And I said, take a wild guess. And he said, for the purposes of this trial, I'll concede that REM are bigger than us. Jury loved it. Jury out five minutes. Triumphant acquittal. Fabulous party in town afterwards. And that was one of the... And, you know, oddly, 22 years later, I still get a Christmas card from Peter Buck. It's an amazing, amazing... It was the most fabulous case. Um, because I think the jury were minded to acquit him within about five minutes of the prosecution opening. Despite an overwhelming prosecution case, we were able to find... All I needed to do was to find a defence, a hook, which would justify an acquittal, and the jury lapped it up. So the power of celebrity, very prominent in criminal trials. Juries love celebrities. And I've done probably 20 celebrity trials. I've never been convicted, no matter how terrible the crime. Um, they just can't get past this adoration of the rich and famous it's a it's a strange thing with juries they they really buy into it so that those two stand out as really great cases i did years ago so top that if anyone can thank you for that very very entertaining stories um uh so now coming to our uh, final question for the evening um I think we can all agree that law can get quite challenging at times. And we have uh, discussed a few challenges of working in multiple jurisdictions so far. Um, I wanted to ask um, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself at the beginning of your career, what advice would you give yourself to overcome some of the challenges that you faced uh, over the years? Uh, we can start off with uh, Rachel, like last time. Um, what advice will I give myself? Um, I think I would say be kinder to yourself. I think we probably are all our own worst critics. And one of the really good things that's happened in recent years is the increasing focus on um, mental well-being 
and well-being generally at the bar and I think we could probably all be a bit kinder to ourselves and not be so harsh upon ourselves. Well, I wasn't expecting to give myself some advice. I was expecting to tell you guys about uh, the challenges to go into international arbitration uh, at the bar uh, from what I see. But I don't know, maybe I would uh, tell myself to not party too much and study a little bit more uh, and try to have uh, an early international experience if you think it would ever work in that field uh, in the future. I'm the opposite. I was such a square. I'd say party a bit more and study a bit less. Um, advice that I would give my younger self. I So I do quite a few mentoring programs um, and I often get a lot of questions coming up about fitting in at the bar and so on. Um, and the advice I give is this, and it is not meant in any way uh, necessarily as a disrespect to any um, one who falls within this category, um, but walk into every interview or scenario as if you are a straight white male who went to Oxbridge, um, because the number of candidates or barristers I come across who fit that profile and are no better than anyone else, but who behave as if they are or have the confidence um, of it. And I just wish that um, people would back themselves a little bit more. The best advice I was given as a pupil was fake it till you make it. If you act like you know what you're doing. Um, then people tend not to find you out. And I was very lucky because I came from Scotland and I didn't really know anything about the bar when I applied. And so I didn't know about the reputation of certain chambers or not. So I walked into every interview like, why wouldn't you give me pupillage? Um, and I think it paid off because I never had any nerves and, and I got offered pupillage. So that would be my advice is just back yourself, and have the confidence, as I say, of a... Oxford educated straight white male, um, and you'll go far. I think if I could advise myself, oh God, years ago is, I remember I was always pretty hard on myself. If I lost a case, I always presumed it was disproportionately my fault. And I've learned as I've got older that in my universal experience, juries tend to get it right. Um, and you would beat yourself up when you got a conviction in the early days, thinking, oh, I wish I'd not asked that, or I should have done this, or I... And you've got to get past that mindset. If you've done the very best you can, you've prepared it, you've done the work, you've presented the best case you thought you could on the day, don't second-guess yourself once the case is over. Um, if there's an appeal, appeal. Um, but it's rarely a well-prepared lawyer who presents his best case is rarely, rarely at fault. Because generally speaking, very few advocates actually make a difference to a case. There are some, there's probably in any one generation of a decade at a time, there's probably 10 silks at the bar in crime who can turn a case, but most verdicts are pretty predictable and it's mainly damage limitation is what you're involved in. Um, and I remember when I was younger, I would beat myself up and worry and take verdicts personally. Um, but as I've got older, I've become much more capable of guilty, 25 years, no real appeal here, folding up the brief, sending it back and moving on to the next one without beating myself up about the fact that I lost it. And you, you need to, you need as early as you can to establish the discipline that you're not looking backwards, you're looking forwards. Just do what you can. I mean, often you will feel guilty if you didn't prepare it properly or maybe you did make a mistake or, but generally speaking, it probably wouldn't make a difference or wouldn't have made a difference. And 
the less time you spend beating yourself up about past failures, probably the better for your whole mindset. So that's probably the advice I would give myself going back years ago. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Trevor, Sir, Fiona, Ma'am Fiona and Rachel Barnes, as well as Carlos Carvalho, sir, for spending your time with us and sharing your experience. Thank you, Claudia, for being an amazing guest today. And I hope you all enjoyed this evening. And before we conclude this evening, like I want to shed some light on our next event. And like there's only four hours left for you to register. Like it's our infusion networking event, uh, which will be held on 4th of February, and which is this Thursday. And we have almost 45 barristers who will be attending and more than 100 students signed up already. So I will put the link in the chat box below and like you can like, I, will, I, I would invite you all to join there and like it's a great opportunity opportunity to network with the barristers as well as explore the practice areas and thank you all for joining us thank you